started. My name is Sarah. I'm the Adult Services Librarian here in McFarland. And I have the honor of introducing Lisa Nolenberg, author of Corpse Pose. We are extremely excited to have her here. We've heard nothing but good things. And I'm very interested in hearing about, you know, yoga studios being the <laughs> Y'all are going to be doing yoga tonight. <laughs> So Lisa, the right? floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am so grateful you're all here tonight. Um, this, it means a lot to me that you're here, and it means a lot to me to be at the library tonight. This place has been so important to me and my family over the years. And in fact, my boys and I used to bike to the old building through the drive through bank that was here, and we'd have to pretend like the tubes were going and all that. So um, this library is awesome, and um, it, it's, fun, it's full circle for me to be back here. Um, Corpse Pose came out in late last fall, and it just kind of um, has been amazing to me, the response I'm getting and the way people are responding to it. But the question I get a lot is like, how did the book, how did it go for you to write the book? What's the process like? So um, I thought I'd talk about that tonight. Um, you should know that all of my template for everything I'm gonna say is based on a presentation I used to give to the kids here at the classrooms at, um, in the district. I've been to every building in the district giving a presentation. So. Um, I tailored it to kindergartners or high schoolers, and I figure y'all are about third graders, so <laughs> let me know if you don't understand stuff, but we'll, we'll go from there. The kids, I ask, at the end I say, ask if anybody has questions, and some of the questions are just hysterical, like, can you do this? And um, They've asked me what my favorite cereal is, and if I, my kids play Fortnite, and then, um, they once asked me what my favorite plan hey what my favorite planet was, which is pronounced Uranus now, by the way. So so we'll ask questions maybe if you guys promise to be good. So along the way tonight I'm gonna to talk about my influences, the in things that have influenced me. And um, when I do wait, I missed a screen. Pre pretend you didn't see that one. When I do speak to the classrooms, I um, show them this picture uh, so they can relate to me as a kid. And this was clearly my Marsha, Marsha, Marsha phase. Um, and I chose these pictures because, as you'll see tonight, I'm pretty much basically stuck developmentally at 12 years old. Like, this is me at 12 years old. And when I think about things that have influenced me, this is Fred, my brace. I have a pretty good case of scoliosis, and Fred really did shape me. I mean, he shaped, I wore him from sixth grade all the way to until I went to college, and of course he shaped my curvy spine. But he also um, was with me through some of the tough adolescent years. People stared at me a lot, and kids asked if I was in a car accident. So unfortunately, Fred also taught me to be kind of self-conscious. So. Um, he shaped me. And then also, these are my brothers. And brothers play a big part in the book, and my brothers play a big part in my life. Shoot. There we go. Um, and again, because they have the maturity of a 12-year-old, I chose this picture because I think my brother's trying not to poop his pants right here. <laughs> I've also been gifted with some pretty amazing parents. My dad is a wonderful, poignant, funny writer in his own right, and my mom owns her own company and easily could be president of the United States. And they're an even bigger part of the book, but they're out of town tonight, so they well, can't be here, but they're very much alive and well, I'm happy to say. Um, in the early years, books were a big priority in our house, and I love this quote from Sandra Cisneros because that was our gig. We would um, load up and go to the library every week, and um, we would just come home with whole stacks to last us for the week. So I tried to do that with my kids, and I just love libraries. I knew I wanted, from an early age, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I even practiced my signature on all my books and all my parents' albums. 
<laughs> I seemed to have an aptitude for writing, but the thing I didn't have was self-confidence. Writers were cool, and I was definitely not. When it came time to choose colleges, I went to the University of Iowa because of the Iowa Writers Workshop. And granted, I didn't have the guts to say out loud that I wanted to be a writer, but I figured if I was close by, I might get it, get, learn things from osmosis. osmosis. Um, I knew I loved words, so I enrolled in the speech pathology program there to learn about how words are formed instead. And one anatomy class later when we worked on an actual cadaver, I quit that program and went back to the writing program. <laughs> I took writing classes from teachers who were involved with the MFA program, and one pulled me aside and told me I should try to get published, and it was like a permission slip for um, the thing I had been wanting to try. So I decided to try after I graduated. I had a stash of essays and nonfiction pieces to try, but I still doubted myself, especially since publishing was a mysterious world with codes to crack, like S-A-S-E, everyone wanted an S-A-S-E, and I didn't know if that was a degree or accreditation. Turns out it's a self-addressed stamped envelope. <laughs> that, I, that I could do. So once I passed that hurdle, I moved on. Whether working full-time or raising kids full-time, I tiptoed my way into a freelance writing career. I was able to have two columns in two different magazines, which was my favorite. But I always had this notion of writing a book. I loved reading suspense, and I loved the fitness world, and I wished I could combine the two. Nobody was doing that that I could see. I love every kind of working out. It helps with my back pain. And apparently, I need to be moving to be creative. So a while back, I tried hot yoga and fell in love with it. After one grueling class, I was laying on my back, staring at the ceiling, trying to figure out how I was going to get up thinking I was going to die, and I thought, this really would be a good place for a murder. <laughs> so right there at the beginning of the book, and I had the title, Corpse Pose, and I had no idea if I could do it, but I decided to try. So I started the summer of 2012. I'd take a handful of kids, ditch them at the Monona pool for the afternoon, and work in the quiet room of the Monona library. After about six months, I realized I had no idea what I was doing. Fiction is an entirely different animal than nonfiction, and I needed help. So the smartest thing I did was to start with classes from Michelle Wilgen and Susanna Daniel from the Madison Writers Net, uh, Studio. And I started with a <clears throat> six-week class with Michelle and realized I was in over my head, but signed up for a year-long class with Susanna, and then Every month, a group of us would meet in her house, and we would work on the, our books. And I came up with a draft um, then of Corpse Pose. Woo! We, here's a reading we did at the end of that year. So 2012, we got to all do a reading at Mystery to Me. And I promised myself, I'm going to be back. I'm going to do a reading here soon. And I got to do it 10 years later. <laughs> But I got to have a reading at Mystery to Me. There's my signed copy even, and they're even here tonight. Lauren's here with books, and it's just been like a dream come true to have, um, to be, you know, again, full circle moment. And as if that wasn't enough, Mystery to Me um, chose my book to do for their April book club, and so, on a Wednesday not too long ago at 6 o'clock, all these people got together. Sorry, it still chokes me up. <laughs> to talk about my book. It's like this own entity in the world now, and I don't know how it went. I don't know. I mean, it was not, could have been too bad. They sent me the picture, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's just fun that it's its own entity out there now, and I, I I'm so appreciative that for all the time I took for you know, worrying about each word that people are talking about it. And I heard there's a book club here tonight, and I just I can't tell you how meaningful that is for people to know people are actually discussing Sam and her story. So the details of how Corpse Pose came to be, I thought I'd use uh, the old journalism, who, what, when, why, where concept to talk about the details. And um, so starting with the who, my characters, 
Once I had a setting and an idea for a plot, a character started forming in my head. I would learned that whoever your main character is, as the author, you need to have a clear idea of them, but you can't put it all on the page. You have to know them inside and out. So this is a screenshot of one of three full pages I have of Sam Jameson. Um, and I think about her all the time, like she's a real person. A few years ago, I was in an elevator, and a woman got in, and she looked just like I pictured Sam would be. So I tried so hard not to stare at her, but I'm sure I did. <laughs> and it, it was like Sam came to life. And I wanted to follow her and see if I had the, the details right in her life. Sam is like me, but better. And in fact, most of my characters are aggregates of people I know and the characteristics that make them interesting to me. I just accumulate info and tidbits like Velcro until I have an idea that sticks. And I think my friends are a little nervous about what's coming next. <laughs> I like to keep images nearby of inspiration for both Sam and for me. Like this image of Brene Brown, the writer. She's a good reminder that to be authentic out in the world. And of course, Caitlin from Iowa. Um, I just love the way she's so poised on the, on the court and off and what a great role model she is for girls. Another inspiration to me is Alexi Pappas, who's an Olympic runner, who is also courageously transparent her mantra before races is, run like a bravey, and I love that. I also like to find things that I think Sam would like, think they were cool, like the uh, little journal entry here. I knew Sam would totally be into that. It's important to me that my characters are layered and have some depth, because I have so many ideas for this series, and the characters need to be able to grow along with it. The what of everything was learning about fiction. So over the years, I've joined organizations, have taken online and in-person classes, I listened to a ton of podcasts, and I've also had to push myself to reach out, especially during the pandemic. Um, I went alone to some conferences and then had to put the word out that I was looking for a critique group, and I ended up starting a group with two strangers, authors who have much more experience than I do, and we meet monthly to critique each other's work. The biggest catalyst in the last few years was joining a mastermind group on how to become a career author, and I found people just like me, and we, um, they're dorks too, and they wear self-doubt <laughs> like coats, but we don't let each other get away with anything. So during one of the early suspense classes that I took, an instructor told us to close our eyes and name two things we're most afraid of, and again, because I'm 12, the things I came up with were, I'm afraid something happened to my parents, and what if I was a bitch in high school and I just don't remember it? <laughs> so that the other people were writing about, you know, storms and scary things happening, and I had corpse posts started right there. Whoop. So the when, like I said, I started writing this book in 2012. Since that time, I've taken all those classes, revised constantly, permanently lost two entire chapters, and tried to find an agent. I really wanted that validation of somebody, an agent, choosing me and then selling the book to a publisher that would you know, prove that my book was good enough to be out in the world. I had this dream of getting an agent and a New York City publisher and then throwing my hat in the air when I was in Times Square. But it turns out p most writers don't even meet their agents in real person, in person, and um, they rarely have big publishing meetings. So. Uh, I was learning about the publishing world through this master class and realizing it was changing in real time. And I was also learning about myself. I learned that rejection was taking its toll. I learned that I might think I'm a chill person, but I process my anxiety at night. At one point, I got close to signing with an agent, and we were casually emailing back and forth during the day. Um, and I didn't realize I was grinding my teeth so hard until I cracked open a tooth and needed a root canal one on either side. <laughs> and that brings us to where. The kids in the classrooms always want to know, where do you write? So I thought I'd share this recent picture of my office. Um, I take a ton of notes, whether my notebook or laptop. And then I transfer it to a software called Scrivener to get it down scene by scene. 
And then my IT family talked me into getting a second monitor, and that's where I keep um, plotting software so once I have a scene done, I can just move the scenes around as I want. That saves a ton of time. And then I finally convert the whole thing into a Word document and massage it until I think it's ready. Then I send it to my critique group who tells me it's not ready. And then I revise and marinate in it for weeks. Um, these are also in my office. Um, uh, remember I talked about that Alexi Papas who runs like a bravey. I made this to remind myself to write like a bravey, to get it all out on the page, even if I think it's weird. And then I used to live just up on Running Deer Trail here, and some of our neighbor kids, instead of having a lemonade sale, they had a motivational poster sale. And so I bought that from them, and the money they made went to the Humane Society. So that's always such a sweet reminder. Sometimes I need to get out of the house for a change of scenery. My husband, Doug, works from home a lot now, so I leave. <clears throat> <laughs> Um, I go to coffee shops or libraries all over Dane County, and once when I couldn't focus, I even tried this, a monastery. <laughs> this is um, Holy Wisdom Monastery in Middleton. It's got great food and trails, by the way. You can sign up for a retreat where you work in your room by yourself for a couple of days, and then you eat with the sis meals with the sisters. Some people sign up to have their whole stay in silence. I stayed there for two days and left my phone in the car so I could focus on finishing the book. And it was painful, but it worked. And the why. Why it, I wander often in these days of like people are so critical and judgmental. Why would I put myself into this right now? But I've decided it's how I connect. I love when a writer can put words into something I'm feeling. It can alter a trajectory. And it, for example, this Lisa. Um, Fred made her self-conscious and awkward, and then she read the book Deanie by Judy Bloom, and she was still self-conscious and awkward, but Deanie made her feel less alone, less damaged, and it empowered her. So after that, she had something to prove. And I learned so much of the world through other people's carefully chosen words, and now I find myself with a few of my own. I'm learning I'm basically an introvert, so when things like this or school presentations seem daunting, I think about one of the, my favorite interactions from fourth graders at Wabisa. I gave a talk on writing the first draft, and the kids had so many questions that we ran out of time. So the teachers suggested I stand in the back, and then the students form a line and just quietly ask me their questions. And a little girl um, waited her turn, and then her question was, can I give you a hug? So we did, we hugged, and then she got in line and waited again and said the same thing. Aww. So sweet. So I try to remember her when I feel self-conscious and remind myself of all the little synapses that are firing in the brains of future writers like that little girl. And finally, how. Um, how I write. First of all, my brain has to be uncluttered. Usually the dishes need to be done and I can't be processing drama or conflict. I listen to a variety of music, depending on the mood of what I'm writing. And I have to be moving in nature. This is from years ago when I was cross-country skiing with my beloved puppy. And I keep notepaper handy because once I start to sweat is when I really get the ideas. I love this quote from Mary Oliver. Keep some room in your heart for the unimaginable because nothing about this process has been like I imagined. Instead of throwing my hat in the air because somebody chose me, I had to choose myself. I had to set aside my self-doubt and convince myself that my voice deserved to be a place in the bookstore and the library too. I had to believe in myself enough to put myself out there and find a publisher myself, one that also believed in me, and walk me through this process with grace. Once the book came out, I never imagined that it would reach so many people, and then people would contact me about what resonated with them. Turns out the things I think are weird are what most people connect with. And I couldn't have imagined meeting some of the people I have along the way, including my new online friend, Lisa. In the next book, Sam runs a relay race and um, with a team of other runners. So when I started researching that, I found this trail running yoga teacher who reads suspense and spells her name, L-E-S-A. 
and now she's answering all my technical questions online. I wanted to quit so many times on this journey, and so many of you were so encouraging. And now that I'm here, I realize that every rejection and setback got me here. I know you're really here for the Rob Lowe quotes, so here's one from his memoir. Don't walk away from the miracle, and I'm so glad I didn't. So this truly is a dream come true for me, and I appreciate you all being here so much. Um, thanks to Sarah and Ben and the library staff and the library board. This uh, library is amazing. Thank you to Lauren from Mystery to Me Bookstore who bought, brought books in case you want to buy one. And then just a reminder, Saturday is Independent Bookstore Day. So if you're looking for something to do, go check them out on Monroe Street for their celebration. Um, I guess that's it. I thought I'd may read a chapter. And then we can answer some question, appropriate questions. <laughs> All right, chapter one. If you're too close to somebody's goodness, then stagger yourselves. The yogi, hands clasped behind his back, stepped carefully between jewel-toned mats. He sported a carpet of black curly hair that trickled from his bare chest to the waistband of his running shorts to mysterious places beyond. It was another lesson in resisting distraction during hot yoga. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, he said. But somebody to my south was still enjoying last night's garlic, and the lanky college student in front of me smelled like a keg. Class had barely begun, and little beads of perspiration were already popping along my hairline as the temperature in the room climbed to a balmy 105 degrees. Reset yourself here in mountain pose. Stand at the top of your mats facing the mirror. I scanned my classmates, beautiful bodies, facing forward, palms outward. Nobody else seemed self-conscious about their creeping underwear or the ramifications of having yogurt for lunch. The only thing circling their heads seemed to be headbands, headbands and man buns. They all appeared regally rooted while I felt completely unmoored. Turn sideways on your mat, bend at the waist, spreading your legs to create an upside down V. My neighbor's goodness was indeed right there looking at me. I shifted to the right of my mat and bent over, looking right back. Judging by her solid abs, she was disciplined. Although she had long, cultish legs, mine were more muscular and defined from years of running. She had a sinewy grace, but I knew I could outsquat her. I'd put my neighbor at around 25, 10 years younger than me. Those 10 years had taken a toll, but here I was in hot yoga, pushing myself past comfort hoping to replace my grief with something new, like peace. Let's move to tree pose. The instructor's voice had a Doppler effect as he moved around the room. It's deceptively simple. Plant one foot firmly on the earth, focus softly, and surrender. My foot slipped and I lost my balance. It's hard to wobble, he said, and I felt like he was calling me out. We all hate it, especially in front of other people. But that wobble is growth. It's you challenging yourself. Wobbling is good. Bull. Wobbling meant you were weak. It meant that no amount of control or vigilance would protect you from losing your stability and what you loved most. If I had learned anything from the world of running, it was that being tough yielded results. There was always a better way. More protein, heavier weights, less sugar, more grit. It was all about taking control. I put my foot down like a petulant child and reset. The class moved to Warrior Two. Finally, something I could do. Warrior Two was definitely my wheelhouse. I did it perfectly in my head, but one look in the mirror and I saw that I was crooked and squat, and as far as I could tell, the only woman in the class without toenail polish. It's not about perfection, I reminded myself. It's about the pursuit. As I tried to enjoy the pursuit, the heat and the wafting aroma of patchouli made me woozy. I stayed in the subpar pose until the final reward, Shavasana. Shavasana, or corpse pose, gives you a chance to reset. We're trained to think that all the good stuff happens when we're pushing ourselves. Shavasana contradicts that. Sometimes it takes a few minutes for your body to assimilate what just happened. Honor that. Namaste, the yogi said. We responded in kind. As he opened the door and left, I felt the magic and safety sealed up with us breeze out the door. After only a few minutes of stillness, restlessness took over. I opened one eye to peek at my fellow yogis and make sure I wasn't the first to break the spell. Then I rolled up my mat and followed the fresh air, feeling better about myself, 
my neighbor, and humankind. Dim lights and scented candles created a mystical feel in the lobby as I moved around sweaty bodies toward the door. The energy was subdued, demonstrating one of the unwritten customs of yoga, the after. Before class, there's polite chatter and small talk. After draws respectful whispers as if nobody wants to sully the air. The body and the soul are quietly realigned, and they both need to fit in the car. Moving along the little cliques of hushed groups, I found my shoes and was the first to escape from the studio into the cool night air. Dusk made a showy appearance as I walked to my car. The parking lot was full of bumper stickers on Subarus, promoting the farm to table movement, the Clean Lakes Alliance, and puppy yoga. It was a good time to be crunchy in Madison. Wisps of wind dried the sheen of sweat on my arms and my hunger was talking. Hummus with red peppers? Red seems more wholesome than green. A protein smoothie? Something salty after all that sweat. Sweet sounded, but thoughts of food dissolved as I looked at my car. As I edged closer, it looked like there was a long vertical scratch on my driver's side door. I squinted and sped up to get past the dump dumpster that blocked my view. As I got closer to the car, my stomach dropped. It wasn't only one scratch. Violent slashes covered the metallic blue, and all that I'd done to be zen in the previous hour evaporated as my chest tightened and my heart rate soared. I glanced toward the studio, hoping nobody else could see what I saw. Carved into my poor little hatchback were five letters, each a foot tall. Bitch. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right, so anybody have questions? Oh. I, I don't really have a question as much as, I really like the brother in it. I, um, at first I thought, oh, I'm not quite sure I, he seemed like he wanted to control everything. Mm -hmm. um, but then I really liked him and I thought, you know, it's good to have a brother in the life. Uh -huh. I do have a couple brothers in my life. And so I really liked that a lot. Good. I thought it the I tried to make him not very appealing in the beginning because yeah. I wanted it to be like a real brother, but then he <laughs> <laughs> it comes he comes around in the end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So what do your brothers think about you being awesome? Um, they're a little scared. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're going to tell more about it. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> no, it's been fun. They, um, they've been watching this whole process forever, and um, so they're very proud, I guess I would say. And one brother doesn't read at all. So he said to me the other day, you know what I like best about your book? The chapters are short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Valerie? When's the next book coming out? Ooh. Well, I am working on it now. I hope January, maybe. I am writing this one, but I'm still thinking about the next third one, so I need to buckle down a little harder and get this one done before. But I, I won't live long enough to write all the books I have in this character. No, I mean, I have like 20, ID, 20 more books, and if they <laughs> each take a long time, maybe I should hire a, an assistant or something. Yeah, same characters. She's just going to be in a different like fitness setting each time. So the next one's running, and then the one after that might be barrel racing. I just wanted to, them to be active little settings that most people don't. You know, we don't normally get behind the scenes of a yoga studio, or um, so I just want it to be different settings. So would you still be Madison? Or? I don't know. I'm thinking like for the horse one. Kentucky might be a good setting, then I'd have to go and research. <laughs> maybe, oh, my old neighborhood, yes. Amsterdam, maybe. I mean, I. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know you love Omaha. How did that come to be that you were going to do three books? Like, is that, did you set out from the very beginning that you were going to propose? You know, when you were looking for an agent and stuff, that you're going to propose a series or how does that Yeah, I, really? yeah, and you just kind of um, show them that you've plotted it out and that you've given it enough time. But yeah, I started out with three, but now I have a few more ideas. So, and this publisher is, is in, so she said, whenever. 
Do you feel tons of pressure? I would feel so much. Pressure. Well, I didn't, Dean. <laughs> I do a little bit. I think that's why this second one. First of all, I kind of forgot how to draft because it's been so long. But then this second one is taking. I'm having to really force myself, and I think it is like, shouldn't this be easier by now? But it's. I think I do feel a little pressure. I'm better at setting aside time to do it, but it's taking a little longer than I'd like. You said you had 20 books in your head, like, but when you started out, you were you weren't fortunate. Like it was difficult to think in a fiction headspace. Are you able to do that now after all the classes and stuff? Is that where all the ideas yeah. are? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Or, or all the reading I've been doing since, like, oh, she did that. That's a good idea. And, you know, just seeing what people are doing out there. Um, like that Maggie Ginsberg you guys said you like, that's incredible book. And, um, you know, it just kind of inspires you to go, oh, what if I added a little sure. dimension of this in? And so, yeah. Oh, uh, I'm not done reading the book yet because uh, a lot of people have been <laughs> wanting to read it. Carolyn's done, but uh, one of the things uh, 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 that I uh, remember is back in the late 60s when I was going to the university, uh, you mentioned in your book the terrace uh, uh, up there at the square and across from the city county building there was a beautiful oh. terrace with yeah. lovely flowers and yes. it was just a great place to, to be all kinds of benches i remember and uh myron kramer who's a supervisor on the east side of town set me up there to mow that lawn <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it took me back. Aww. Aww. I used to do that. Thank you, Connie. And that's what I mean. Like the books, when they resonate with you, it just is so, it reminds you of something you haven't thought about for years. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. Hi. Um, so now that you've been through the process once, are you doing, are you, did you change the process at all while oh. working on second I'm sorry, I got so distracted in my head there for a minute because you're such a process person. I still have the notes from when my son Noah, this is Amy Case, one of Noah's old teachers and, not old teachers, one of Noah's <laughs> teachers. But that you worked out a whole sheet of process and I, I love process so yeah, I'm much more regimented now. I have, it's like there's different parts of my brain. Mornings are for drafting, and then I got to move, and then afternoons are for a little more like, you know, social media is a big part of it now. And so, yeah, I have to categorize throughout the day, and I'm much more disciplined about that now. Anybody else? Well, when I was reading it, I, I'm not going to um, but I really did enjoy how you started each chapter. Oh, good. And, you know, I thought, oh, yeah, I remember that. And, you know, so it was, it was good, and it made me think about that. Good. I hope to do that with the other books, you know, running. You could, I can talk about stretching. I'm not sure about the horse stuff yet, but I'm sure there's something with every sport that there's, you know, little teasers like that. So thank you. Yeah, that's something that people seem to really like. And it's fun to write, really fun to write. Lauren? I love the cover. Can you talk about how it? Yeah, so that's all the publisher. She's a graphic designer by trade. And she came up with this based on what I th described, but I don't have a visual bone in my body. So we started like this, and I'd say, well, what about this? And I, I really wanted a man mandala, you know, the little, um, you know what I'm trying to say? And she was just like, I don't think that's going to work. So she, just to make me happy, put it on the outside. But this was all her, and she did a great job. She just got an eye for it. I didn't want a 
real face. I didn't want a, you know, a person's act, a, you know, clip art or anything. So, yeah. I just want to say that I've read several books that I've known the author personally, and that's hard sometimes to take what you know about the person who wrote the book yeah. out of reading the book. And in this book, very early on, I forgot you wrote it. Oh, good. <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, good. And like, I think that's a good thing. Good. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks, Arlene. My uncle, on the other hand, said it was you in my head. It was you all the time until it got to the sex scene. And then he's like, I did not want to read that part. <laughs> All right, well, if there aren't any more questions, I just want to say thanks again for coming tonight. It's so fun for me to be able to talk about it, and I appreciate all of you all. And um, if you want to sign up for my newsletter, I promise it's only going to come out when I have something fascinating to say. So not very often, but um, <laughs> some of you signed up for it before, but we have a new provider, and we're not sure those all transferred. So if you want to re-sign up for it or online, um, and thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate it.